How are y'all doing today? I would say good evening, good morning, but I don't know when you're going to be watching this. Welcome in to our Once Upon a Pastime series. As uh, today, this is, we're calling this Game One because we're going to go over the World Series. And I think a lot of folks out there probably don't know the history of the World Series. They probably, they might know a little bit about it, but may not know the whole nine yards. And that's kind of what we're going to do today. We're going to get into the World Series. We're going to get into a lot of things about the World Series. This isn't just going to be some tutorial about who won what game and whatnot. We're going to get into a lot of the stuff. And it's going to be a seven-part series, and uh, we should have a lot of fun with it. But we're going to talk about the different things about the World Series, certain things you may not be aware of, you know, some things you may know, but we're just going to reinforce them. But I think you're going to learn a lot more than more than anything else i think you're going to have a lot of fun so we look forward to this been holding off uh doing this until this time of the year as uh, the world series is upon us so we're going to go ahead and dive in to the world series and to do that i do think that we have to take a little bit of a almost a uh a backstroke in the fact that we got to go before what happened with the World Series. The World Series took place in 1903, the very first World Series. And it was be between the Boston Americans, they later became known as the Boston Red Sox, and the Pittsburgh Pirates. And the Pittsburgh Pirates, Boston Americans, or Red Sox as we know them now, they took on a nine-game series. At the time, it was a nine-game series, and Boston won five of those eight games. They won five and three in the series, and they took home the first World Series championship. Now, one of the misnomers about this that I think a lot of folks probably are not aware of, and look, unless you're deep into the baseball history like I have been, why would you know this, right? You know, a lot of stuff going on in your life, and you just kind of want to find out who's going to win this year, et cetera, et cetera. But I, baseball by far has been my favorite of all the sports to cover. And one of the reasons why is because of the history of the sport. Now, realize professional baseball – essentially started in 1857 1857 you started getting professional baseball teams and the most famous of course were the Cincinnati Red Stockings that became a, a full-blown professional baseball team by 1869 now one of the things that people get confused about because you'll hear the language of, well, Cincinnati says that they're the oldest team. The Braves say they're the, the longest continuous team. What the hell is going on here? The Cincinnati Reds are the oldest team in baseball. The Cincinnati Red Stockings, or Red Legs, excuse me, the Cincinnati Red Legs began playing ball and they had some of the best players in all of the game at the time for obvious reasons. I mean, they, they were the first professional team. They were taking on all comers and they were really a barnstorming team because there, there wasn't a real league when the Reds first started playing ball. There wasn't an actual league for them to dive into because when you're the first, you, you do a lot of barnstorming tours. And what they were doing was they were going from town to town. They were hosting a lot of games, but they were going from town to town, taking on all comers. And the Cincinnati Reds started playing in 1869. And they then had a long winning streak of 131 games. 
and it came to an end. And because that winning streak came to an end, the fanfare fell off. The fans that were out there, and I guess you could call this, if you want to look for something, Cincinnati Red fans in the late 1800s were your very first bandwagon fans. They were going out watching games, watching them beat teams, usually by big amounts. And there was finally a game played in New York where they went into the very first extra inning game. And what could have been called a tie, they decided that they were going to go ahead and try something new, extra innings. And that extra innings team, that team that went to extra innings, ended up losing the ball game to the New York squad that they were playing that day. And the news got back, and the next thing you know, everybody's off the bandwagon. And they quickly disbanded the team shortly after that because fans weren't coming out to the game. It wasn't until you got real structure in Major League Baseball that we know it today. The real structure began in the early 1870s. And we had a league called the National Association of Professional Baseball Players, the NAPBP. It was shortened for most people just referred it to the NA, the National Association. And what they did was they came about and they won over the hearts of a lot of fans out there because you were having professional games. They were playing very regularly at the time. And on that, on top of that, there were rivalries starting to be born. Fans were coming back out. And so Cincinnati started their team back up at that time period. So that's why there is a break in the action of when the Reds shut it down and then they come back. But along this timeline, the Atlanta Braves start playing their their entire history begins during this time period. And the Atlanta Braves at the time were in Boston. And they begin playing ball in 1871. And in 1871, the Atlanta Braves come in and they are at the time they don't change to the name of the Boston Braves until much later. But at the time, this team was known as the Boston Red Stockings and it confuses the hell out of everybody, rightfully so, because you've got the Boston Red Sox who were being called off a number of different names. We'll get into that today. They finally land on the Red Sox because the Red Stockings had at that point changed their name several times and it was a popular name in the area. You didn't have all the stuff you have have today on the fact that, well, you can't name that team that and you can't do this, et cetera, et cetera. So with all that being said, the Atlanta Braves franchise begins in 1871. They're known as the Boston Red Stockings at that point. They're known as the Boston Red Caps from 1876 to 1882. The Bean Eaters from 1883 to 1906. Then they go to the Boston Doves from 07 to 1910. The Rustlers in 1911. They go to the Boston Braves from 1912 to 1935. You would think, okay, 1912, let's go. We, we got it. We're the Braves, and that's been the, nope. That's not it. From 1936 to 1940, five seasons, they be they become known as the Boston Bees, and then they go back to the Boston Braves in a, in 1941, 
and have been the Braves franchise ever since. So when we are looking at the beginning of professional baseball and the first team to really take the torch, it was the Braves franchise because this was an organized league. Now, they obviously did not have a world championship series like the world series that did not come about until 1903, but there were informal postseason series. They never crowned a champion through these series. They were really more looked upon as exhibitions. So what you have to go off of, if you're looking for the champion of those leagues in the early going and the earliest you can really get your head around would be the 1871 season, because before that you had a lot of minor, well, they were professional teams, but they were scattered all throughout. It wasn't very organized and they didn't have a lot of, you know, quote unquote league championships. In 1871, that becomes the first concrete. This is a, this is a real live organized professional baseball league in 1871 and they are known as the NA, the national association. Of course, if you were going through the whole thing, national association of professional baseball players, I don't think they were worried about social media back then. So they didn't worry about the, how long the damn name was, but you get it. You, you get the drift. It was founded in March of 1871. It folded 1875. And the reason why was because this becomes the groundwork of what is known now as the national league. And of course the national league is the father, the grandfather of major league baseball because the American League doesn't really come in, into play till about 20, 25 years later. At the time in 1871, you had nine teams. It went up to 11. It dropped back down to nine, to eight, to 13. It was a, it was a literally, think of some of your other sports, professional sports franchises today that, are, that have tried to succeed and they have failed and they come back and the others try to take them. A lot of football leagues come to mind. This is essentially what was going on in major league baseball, but teams that are still around today that were in that original, in that original group of the national association of professional baseball players. Teams like the Braves, teams like they were called the White Stockings, another confusing thing here. They're called the White Stockings, but they were eventually the Chicago Cubs. The Athletics, Philadelphia Athletics were in this league. Later on in the 1880s, the Philadelphia Phillies show up. You've got the New York Giants that are obviously become the San Francisco Giants. You have the Brooklyn Bridegrooms that eventually become the Brooklyn Dodgers, Los Angeles Dodgers. So when, when you're talking about the teams that were in these leagues, you're basically talking about the foundation of of what we know as professional sports today, because the national league is the oldest professional sports league there is. And so everything that, and it doesn't matter if someone thinks that their sports is superior to baseball. We all know, first of all, we all know that's not true, but second of all, it doesn't matter what they believe to be true on that, on that end. The fact of the matter is everything that you can think of, whether it's professional sports, even college sports, it was all born off the idea of what baseball was doing. And when 
you go into that and you go and you do a deep dive, you realize, first of all, they were really fighting a losing battle in a lot of these markets. You know, there, there was a lot of tough things going on in the United States at the time, and you were trying to convince people to come out and play or come out and pay to watch people play a game. It, it, it was a foreign concept. We've all heard the stories about how hard it was to get people to come out to watch professional football in the 1920s. Well, imagine how difficult it was to get people to come out and pay for professional baseball in the 1880s, 1870s, 1890s and beyond. There's all kinds of accounts and I love them when, when you hear these quotes of, of people talking about how in how how absurd it is that anyone would be would pay for a game that anybody there there were several leagues that stood by their honor of we will never take a dime now those leagues obviously folded but this is but this is what we have in What is now Major League Baseball, it, it was the NA and then, of course, the NL, and then they brought in the American League. And so taking a quick look at the NA, there were five years in the NA, 1871 through 1875. The very first championship in 1871 And you gotta and you gotta realize something. These teams were were having. I mean, you talk about awful, and I mean just awful conditions. Not just where the games were played, but think about having to actually go and travel. But the very first championship of the National Association, as we'll just call it, the NA, were the Philadelphia Athletics. And the Philadelphia Athletics, and that name changed back and forth, and they disbanded and came back, et cetera, et cetera. But the Philadelphia Athletics won the very first championship. After that, and at the time, they went off of not winning percentage, but how many games you won. Some teams played many more games than the other. But going back and looking over it, there was never a situation until they changed the rules, which I believe was 1883, that they changed the rules that they would go by winning percentage. That was the first time that that was introduced. There was never a time that a champion would have been a champion because of winning percentage. It came up in a debate because the previous year, a team that finished fourth was actually should have been second off a of winning percentage. And that is, that's the whole reason why it came about now. Now, luckily, they had enough sense and really it was, it was just bragging rights at that point, but they wanted to, to, to clarify, Hey, let's go ahead and get into this and let's, and let's come up with a fair way of deciding a winner. Because remember there were games that were not finished. There were games you will, if you go back and you look at, at the records of some of these teams, deep dives and you see all these ties, like, what the hell was that? Well, there was, there was no artificial lighting and depending on what time they started game, because a lot of these guys were working in the factories during the day and then they were playing baseball in the afternoon going into the early evening. And it's why baseball was created and played in the summertime because obviously you have much longer days. But there were a lot of games that were played back then that would end in a tie and you, and you did not have you didn't have a situation where they called someone the winner after X amount of innings. If it ended in a tie, that's just what it was recorded as was a tie. Now there were some leagues that would just disband the entire contest and it, it wouldn't even go into the books. And that's why when they started doing these deep dives on going back to, to uh, players, overall numbers, and we're talking about going back and seeing who belongs in the Hall of Fame and who doesn't. 
we're talking about guys that are going to be coming in from the 1880s and whatnot. They had to go back and do a lot of deep dives because a lot of these games were not being counted. So of those five seasons, 1871, 72, 73, 74, and 75, five, five seasons were played in the national association that, that essentially was the grandfather of the national league. Philadelphia wins the first one, the athletics, not the Phillies. Phillies come start playing. They start playing ball in 1883. The Atlanta Braves organization, which at the time was the Boston Red Stockings. They won 1872, 73, 74, and 75. And the team that was looked upon as arguably the best of that group because you had a lot of different teams back then that first of all, there, there was a lot of different uh, arguments on whether which league was best, but by the time you get to the national association, it was looked upon as by far the best team. And if you want to look at the team's, at that time of who was the best, I think you have to take a real hard look at the 1875 team right before they go into the National League. That team went 71, 8, and 3, an 899 winning percentage, something that would never be even considered nowadays, right? But 1883. I'm sorry, 1875, 71, 8, and 3. That's the team. And if you're, if you're wondering, okay, well how, well, how many players that played in that league were really elite? There were eight Hall of Famers that played in the National Association. You had guys, and even, even the, the most modest of baseball fans, I won't even say, I'd have to see it after being a historian, the ones who have watched baseball have in, have uh, consumed a lot of baseball over the years. You've heard a lot of these names: Cap Anson, Albert Spalding. Yes, that Spalding, Albert Goodwill Spalding. The one, the one where you see the name printed on the balls and the gloves. That Spalding was in this league. Candy Cummings. He was known as the grandfather of the curveball. He created the curveball, according to many. And that's actually a funny story. If you've never heard it real quick, he was, during the offseason, he was out on a lake and was throwing a seashell across the lake, was making it curve, and he wondered, because of the curvatures in the, in, in the shells, could he make a baseball do that? And he quickly found out that he could. And so the, the curveball was born. Of course, at the time it was controversial. People felt like, remember something, when baseball first starts and starts being competitive, it wasn't until Cummings came up with the curveball, the pitching was being looked upon. Before that, you were supposed to aid the batter. At that, In fact, a lot of teams, a lot, a lot of your professional leagues before the National Association a lot of your leagues, their guy pitched to their guy. So it was like batting practice. And when it ended up happening was when guys like Candy Cummings started finding out ways to get you out. Then it became very imperative that you had an elite pitcher and the rest is history. But when you go to that very early part, and you talk about the elite teams of that time period, it was the Boston Red Stockings, now known as the Atlanta Braves, that were the cream of the crop. I mean, four consecutive championships, forget about it. You go just a little further in there, and you take a look at once it becomes the National League, and that becomes... a league of itself by 1876. 
I think a lot of people are familiar with the fact that it's been around since 1876, mainly because the logo, if you've ever looked at it closely on the National League, has 1876 in it on most of them. So some of them, you know, leave them out. But there are currently 15 teams in the National League. But it was founded in 1875. And essentially what they were trying to do when they built the National League in 1876, they were trying to have strong owners and they wanted a low entry fee for for each club with the incentive to stay in the league because, because what they did not want is what happened in the National Association along with a couple of other leagues that never really came came to the forefront is they had a lot of teams that were having a team one year and then they were dipping out. That's not what the national league wanted. In fact, they had an entry fee at the time. Think about this. You could have bought your own national league team at the very beginning for $10. Now you would have also had to have paid your salaries, et cetera, et cetera. But $10 was the entry fee. But the one thing that they wanted all these businessmen to be involved in, guys like William Hubert of the Chicago White Stockings, later known as the Cubs. Guys like Harry Wright and George Wright. Those were other guys that, that were in the, in the National Association associated with the Red Stockings. They came over to the National League. But you had teams at that time. It was the Louisville Grays. It was the Cincinnati Reds, the St. Louis Brown Stockings, the New York Mutuals, the Hartford Dark Blues, Boston Red Stockings, Philadelphia Athletics, and the Chicago White Stockings. Those were your original teams. And when you look at the champions of those leagues, as we get closer to talking about what we're here to talk about, the World Series, the Braves organization, the Red Stockings, they win the National League pennant in 1877, 78, 83, 91, 92, 93, 97, 1897, 1898, a total of eight. So by the time we hit the 20th century, what is now known as the Atlanta Braves organization, they had 12 world championships. They will go on to win four more. They won the 1914 World World Series, the 57 World Series, the 95, and the 2021. But if you ever noticed any of the stuff that I put up, if I put anything championship-wise about the Braves organization, I always have it claimed with 16 World Championships. That's why they won 12 World Championships before the World Series was ever created. Because no one felt like anyone but the National Association and then the National League was anything but the cream of the crop. It was kind of, it's kind of like to, to the effect of when you had the AFL coming up in the 1960s and everyone still looked upon it as your actual champion of the National Football League. It's kind of like what when people say, well, why in the hell do people call Green Bay title town? Because the Green Bay Packers won all those world championships before the Super Bowl was created. Same thing. It just happened a little longer ago. It's the same exact thing. Other teams that won champions, they had a team named the Detroit Wolverines that ended up crashing and burning. They, they went from 1881 to 1888 they won the 83 champion. They, they won one championship and then they were dissolved. The Brooklyn bridegrooms later on the super balls and they are the super balls until the, until the late, uh, the, the first decade of the 20th century 
where they eventually become the trolley Dodgers and then, of course, the Dodgers. And they changed their names a few times uh, in the 1920s and whatnot. But for all intents and purposes, they went from, just to keep it simple, they went from the bridegrooms who won it in 1890. The Super Bowls won in 80, 89 and 1900. Still same franchise. The New York Giants, the New York baseball Giants that eventually go out to San Francisco. They go out there and they win the championship in 1889, 1888, and they cause a stink in the 1904 World Series, which we'll get into here in a second. And the, the, the 1904, remember the World Series starts in 1903. Because of the New York baseball giants, there is no World Series in 1904. The Baltimore Orioles, just like the Boston Red Stockings, were looked upon as a heck of a of a powerhouse. The Baltimore Orioles. They win the championship from 1894, 1895, and 1896. And there's something else interesting about the Baltimore Orioles. First of all, John McGraw plays for the Baltimore Orioles. And John McGraw later on would have such a big rivalry with the American League because he went, oh, he left the Orioles to go to the American League, then got kicked out of the American League, fighting with their their uh, their commissioner, Ban Johnson. That when you get to the 1904 World Series, and the Giants win the National League, remember they'd only played the World Series once. He didn't look at them being worthy of playing the New York Giants, so he decided that his team was not going to play. The following year, they win the pennant again, and his owner forces him to play because there was so much money involved comparatively at the time. And the players were ticked off. (laughs) They were really ticked off at him as well because they found out that had they played in that World Series, they would have made almost as much as 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 they did for the entire season. So obviously, if always follow the money when, when it comes to this kind of stuff. But when you look at the Baltimore Orioles of that time, not only were, were they very dominant in winning the championship, you, if you've ever heard the term the Baltimore chop, and most people have, and they know what it means. It means, it means you smack the ball on the ground, it goes high, and you try to beat it out to first. Now, in today's baseball, the Baltimore chop is pretty much looked upon as a goofy thing that happens. There were some attempts in the 1970s and 1980s to make it a part of the game plan, but they never could quite get it back to where it was in the 1800s. 1890s. But there were some attempts to use the the AstroTurf, the artificial turf, to do the Baltimore chop. But now pitchers nowadays, because because the velocity and the movement on the ball, it's very difficult to do this. But what they were doing, and this was this was not they weren't they didn't come up with the term Baltimore chop because oh by the way, they just happened to hit a lot of balls off the ground, high in the air. It was an actual strategy. And they were going up, slamming the bat over the ball and popping it up. And a lot of these fields were really hard. Hard as Some some of them were, I mean, you barely had any dirt on it at all. So you were almost playing on concrete. And that ball would bounce and it would go high in the air. And by the time the thing came down, everybody was safe. And the Baltimore Orioles of the 1890s, that was actually what they were known for. 
They had several batsmen that were actually very good at it. And one John McGraw was really the reasoning for it. But you had teams in those early part here. Here are some teams and here are some cities that you had at that time. Obviously the Boston Red Stockings, we talked about them. The Chicago White Stockings, we talked about them. Cleveland Forest Cities, the Fort Wayne Kiangas, New York Mutuals, Philadelphia Athletics, Rockford Forest Cities. The Washington Olympics, the Brooklyn Atlantics, who only lasted for four years, but the Brooklyn Atlantics were known as being quite the draw. They had ownership, man, uh, ownership issues, but the Brooklyn Atlantics at one point were, were known as one of the favorite teams in the league. Brooklyn F. Eckfords. The Baltimore Canaries, Middletown Mansfields, Washington Nationals, which is essentially why today's Washington National team grabbed that name. It was a throwback. Philadelphia White Stockings, Hartford Dark Blues. You see a lot of teams with a lot of names involving what they wore because that because that's that's how and, you know you know this is obviously before someone would go out and buy your 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 garb but what they were trying to do is name their team after their laundry because it was a way to get the fans behind them you had a st louis red stockings team for one year and the official name was changed because of complaints from the boston red stockings And you also had the St. Louis Brown stockings and they were named that in the same exact year. They, they both played in 1875. So not a lot of creativity with a lot of these names, but it, everything was new. You know, there's, there's a, there's a famous story when they talk about during this time period that there was a a garment maker that was trying to talk the national league into going out and have each individual position wearing specific colors. And what I mean by that is everybody's first baseman would wear blue. Everybody's third baseman would wear red. It was quickly disbanded because the newspaper writers tore it to pieces calling them, uh, what, what was the term? Uh, it looked like a Dutch bed of tulips out there, basically saying like the whole thing just, it was terrible looking, but the guy was trying to make some money. And because baseball was becoming so damn popular, this is what we were getting. So we get through the 19th century. Baseball is becoming extremely popular. The American League pops up. They've been going strong for a few years and they've started to poach players and there was nothing stopping them. And, and for a very small period of time, the players had the power and they, be, they would go. And of course, later on, we go through all the, all the contract issues that we've dealt with in professional sports for years and years and years. But you can imagine there was a little bit of a, huh, I can go over here and make more money. Why the hell am I staying here with you? And they would bolt. And then the next season, they would go right back because they were offered more money. And this was happening in the middle of seasons. So eventually what happens is both sides, the American League and the National League, kind of band together and prevent a lot of that. And then later on in the early 20th century, there are other leagues that pop up, leagues like the Federal League and whatnot, that are once again trying to poach. But what what the uh what Major League Baseball does at that time 
is they basically beat them at their own game. And they end up squeezing out these upstart leagues that are trying to compete with them, guaranteeing a boat ton of money to the players. Once those leagues folded, they, they turned around and they cut their salaries. So it was very cutthroat in the first 60 or so years of major league baseball, major league, the guys who had invested, they were making money off of this. They were trying to keep something of theirs alive. And there were other people trying to come up and create something say, saying, you know, why can't we have a part of the, of the American dream? So it's a very, it's, it's probably my, my favorite era of baseball. Cause everything, it was really wide open. It was, it was like the wild West. You never knew what the hell was going to go on. You never know who was going to bounce from one team to another. And then some players were, were getting banned for doing it. And some, and some players were, were jumping back and forth with nothing happening to them. So we get to the early 1900s and they finally, the national league and American league decide, all right, both leagues are, are getting very popular. We need to legitimize one champion. And this is when winning your pennant no longer makes you the champion. This is when it all begins. And it begins with the 1903 World Series. In the 1903 World Series with Boston, playing Pittsburgh, and Boston was already a very popular baseball city with the dominance of the Red Stockings, now known as the Braves. But here's the funny thing. If you think they had a fan base that stuck with them through thick or thin, you would be wrong because a lot of your Boston Red Stocking fans jumped over to the Boston Americans, now known as the Red Sox, simply because they could go watch baseball for just a little cheaper. There's arguments on how much it is, but for essentially the National League team was charging a dollar a game. The American League team was charging 50 cents a game. And because of that, and the droves of people going to the now Red Sox team, the National League team, the Braves, lost a lot of their funding. Because you got to remember, back then, there, were, you know, there was no media money coming in. So they lost their money. They had to sell players off. They were getting poached by the American League team. A lot of the guys that were on the 1903 Boston Americans had just left the National League Boston team that becomes the Braves. It originally developed from something called the Western League. The Western League played baseball from 1885 to 1900. And then it was developed from a couple of other areas. But essentially, if you want to know when it all began, essentially, Ban Johnson put teams together and they started playing baseball in 1901. By 1903, that was January 1901. By 1903, two years later, just two years later, can you imagine this in today's sports world? They were playing the National League for, for the World Championship. That is literally the equivalent of some random professional, whether you USFL, XFL, whatever. And in two seasons, all of a sudden, all of a sudden you're grabbing their champion to play the Super Bowl champion for, for all the marbles. So it's pretty impressive what the American league did in that very short time period. Van Johnson was a controversial figure, but no matter how you look at him, some of the stuff that he did, did did against the players and whatnot. Ban Johnson built that damn team, built that league. And you get to the 1903 World Series. You get the Boston Championship, and then we talked about it real quick, and I'll just dive back into it real quick. The, the 1904 World Series is never played. The 
And that would not happen again for another 90 years when the strike would happen. In the World Series, 1904, it was being it was being called the boycott. The boycott series. According to McGraw, he didn't want to play them because he looked at the American League as, as inferior. But everybody knows it was because he held sour grapes against Ben Johnson in the American League, which he had just came from. So in 1904, there was no World Series. But 1905, the Giants win it again. And this time, the owner of the Giants, along with the players, said, we got to play him. McGraw, there's too much money involved. I mean, you were getting people sitting on, on top of fences all around. And, and we're only talking about a couple of seasons in, in into the American League even existing. In the 1903 World Series, there are many accounts of people lined across the walls in very dangerous spots in Boston just to get a glimpse of what the original World Series was. So then we get to the 1905 World Series. And in the 1905 World Series, you have once again the New York Giants and you have Connie Mack's Philadelphia A's. And we talked about the A's being the first champion of the National Association. Connie Mack takes over the Philadelphia A's in the very early 1900s. He was a manager there for 50 years. You'll always see pictures of him in the dugout. He was the last to wear three-piece suit, typically wore a top hat as well. And he was known as a great baseball mind. You know, you know all, all these spray charts and all these uh, uh, different charts that they have nowadays? from no matter who you want to take your information from. But all the fan graphs and whatnot, according to folks that played with and played against Connie Mack of those days, Connie Mack was doing the same damn thing back then, but it was all in his head. So obviously he didn't have a computer. But he would take notes and jot them down and they said the and this is this is something you don't even see today. He had a sign set up on the bench and he was directing his defense where to stand infield and outfield pitch by pitch. Now, we all know that Connie Mack has the most wins in the history of baseball. He also has the most losses. One of the reasons why his teams never sustained wins, Connie Mack was also part owner. And what he found out was usually it was better to have a team that was middle of the pack to sell them off. And he would make more money just because of the way it was set up back then financially than if he had a team that was really good or a team that was really bad. So he started off a lot of seasons. Now, he had great success. He won World Series. He won pennants. Don't get me wrong. But he had some he had some seasons where they were playing very well, and all of a sudden they were selling them off. And he did this a few times. He, he sold his teams off to uh, teams like the Boston Red Sox. He, he sold them off to the Highlanders. He sold them off to the Braves at one point. But he is in the second World Series, and it's the New York Giants, and Connie Mack's New York Giants go out there and win four games to one. And you know he had to feel like that he had to go out there and win that World Series. Because if you're going to say someone's inferior to you, you better win it all. By the way, that Giants team won 105 games that year, lost 48. That Giants team went out, and at the time, they had the Christian gentleman, the great Christy Mathewson. And over a six-day span, Christy Mathewson won three games, complete games. 
People talked about that for decades. When you, most folks remember the Madison Bumgarner 2014 unbelievable run that he went in, right? When they would always circle back to no one has done this since, it was always that 1905 Christy Mathewson, the Christian gentleman. Why was he nicknamed the Christian gentleman? It was simple as this. Back then, they had tobacco cards. You would get some tobacco and you get a baseball card. Christy Mathewson said, I want no part of that. I don't want kids going out buying tobacco to get my cards. This is where the bubblegum card is born. And because of that, and because of things like he, he refused to give interviews to sports writers, if he found out they were running around on their wives, it was things like that that he became known as the Christian gentleman. But he went out there and absolutely dominated the Philadelphia A's. It was the dead ball era. We don't get out of the dead ball era for a little while. But when you look at what Christy Mathewson did in that game, he pitched a shutout in game one. He pitched a shutout in game two. Or I'm sorry, game three. And then Christy Mathewson goes out and pitches a shutout in game five. So they win four games to win. He wins three of them. They didn't have it back then, but obviously he would have been MVP. And still, for my money, the most dominant World Series performance ever. But you st- I always put an asterisk by it because it happened so long ago. It's not really the same sport with the dead ball air, all that kind of stuff. But for his t- for his time period, they they talked about that for years. It wasn't like it was one of these things that just happened. They said, well, everyone- no, no, no. They talked about it for years. And by the way, you talk about some names. Eddie Plank is who Matthewson beat. And people who know... Baseball will, will, you know, will know these guys. Joe McGinty, the great Joe McGinty, was on that New York team. He lost to Chief Bender. Who is Chief Bender? Chief Bender is the guy that ends up eventually playing for the for the Cleveland baseball team that they name the team after, and the team keeps that name for over a hundred years of the Cleveland Indians. That's why you had the Cleveland Indians because of Chief Bender. He was in that, in that series, Joe McGinty. They called him iron Joe McGinty because he routinely pitched double headers all the time. And didn't didn't think anything of it. There's a famous story of Joe McGinty pitching a double header because he told his manager that if, if he, if he asked him, he said, if I pitch this double header today, Can I have the next few days off? Because he wanted to go hunting. I mean, the names in this series. This this is baseball. So you go to the 1905 series. So you got two of them under your belt. And the 1906, this is another famous World Series. And it's one I don't think a lot of people understand the gravity of it. But this team... This was the white socks, not the white stockings, but they were playing the old white stockings that had been been known as the Chicago Cubs by them. And they were playing the $100,000 infield. Tinker's never a chance, right? And the Cubs were looked upon as a prohibitive favorite. The Cubs in 1906 had 116 wins. In 36 losses. If you remember history being chased by the Seattle Mariners on the most wins in a season, this was the team they were chasing. 
I still don't think anyone's ever going to catch that in a 154 game season, 116 games. Oof. And they were known as, as just an absolute juggernaut and they would prove it later, but not this year. They would play their crosstown rivals, the Chicago white Sox, who were affectionately called the hitless wonders. Why is that team batting average was two thirty. Was that good or bad that year, McGee? Ah, it was the worst in the American League, and they still got to the uh, won the pennant. They won the pennant because they were on an incredible run. Remember, there, there were no playoffs back then. You just you won the pennant. You went to the World Series. They went on an incredible run of a nineteen game winning streak in August towards the end of the season blew everyone's doors off and took the took the pennant and then go out there and the White Sox face the Cubs in the first crosstown championship. They take game one, two to one. The Cubs go out there and flex their their muscles. And score seven runs in the second game. Series tied up one to one. White Sox come back, win it three nothing. Cubs come back, win it one nothing. Then the White Sox come back and win the next two games, eight to six and eight to three. And everybody was amazed because the hitless wonders had broken out and they won the championship. Well, maybe the Cubs just weren't that good. You ever think about that? Ah! The Chicago Cubs win the next two World Series. The Chicago Cubs at that time were looked upon as the best team baseball had seen. Outside of those great 1800 teams from uh, Boston. The 1907 World Series. You got some famous names in this. But the one you would want to circle would be Ty Cobb. Three fingers, Mordecai Brown on the Cubs. Tinker to Evers to Chance. Sam Crawford, another legendary figure. Hugh Jennings, one of the great managers of all time. And... The Cubs go out there and they sweep the Detroit Tigers. By the way, 107 wins again. So they have, so in two seasons, they have 223 regular season wins. They finally bring home that, that elusive world series. The 1908 series comes in. And this one is a little murky because they play the Tigers again. The Cubs beat the Tigers again. You still have a lot of your same names, Sam Crawford, Ty Cobb, Tinker's Devers a chance, Mordecai Brown. But that's not the story of the season. The story of the season was Merkel's boner. And how the how the Chicago Cubs got there. Guy by the name of Fred Merkel, infamous playing baseball history. And obviously nicknames and monikers mean different things now than they do back then. Back then a boner was known to, known as a boneheaded play, a dumb play. And Merkel's boner refers to his notorious base running error. And at that time, it was not Fred Merkel's fault per se, because it's just how it was done. It wasn't until this game that was so well followed because Chicago Cubs and New York Giants were the top of the standings. There was a similar instance a few weeks ago, and it's how the Cubs infield knew, knew to to follow up on the play, but it wasn't as 
as publicized because it wasn't the top two teams in the game. And you also have to think about this too. You have the New York papers, Chicago papers. Back then, newspapers were coming off the presses three, four times a day. So this was more stuff for them to talk about. And if you're not familiar with it, real quick, here's what happened. Fred Merkel, in the middle of the pennant race, and by the way, the Pittsburgh Pirates, who had won the pennant in uh, 1901, 1902, and 1903, they were right in the middle of this of this pennant race. It, they were going three wide into the corner, as we say, right? Merkel was 19 years old. He ended up having a pretty good career, but everyone will always remember him for this. He only played 38 games all damn year, but this is the one everyone's going to remember. So there is a leadoff single or a, a single with one out, excuse me. Eventually, the winning run in Art Devlin and Merkel are on base. Devlin standing on second, Merkel standing on third, or on first, excuse me. And then all of a sudden, there was a base hit. And the base hit comes through, the winning run scores, and Merkel from first to second. Now, back then, there were fans that were standing on, on all sides of the field, right where, where the foul lines are nowadays. Fans stood there. You didn't have the divides that you do nowadays. And the ball is hit into the outfield. The fans rush the field. It's the bottom of the inning. Merkel is assuming the game is over and he never touches the bag. Because all these fans are rushing onto the field, he runs off out of the way. One of their infielders, the shortstop, Al Bridwell, was the guy that gets the hit. He does touch first. But the problem is Merkel never goes and touches second. So the the infield of the Cubs are aware of this and they start jumping up and down, get me the ball, get me the ball. The ball was out there. There were fans fighting over it. They had to fight the damn ball away from them to get it back into the infield, touch second base. And because, because Fred Merkel had never touched the bag, it was being looked upon as a force out and not that, Hey, the game's over. It's a, it, you know, there's basically a riot in the middle of the field. Let's move on. The umpire stood out, standing out there after seeing the infielder jumping up and down on the bag, touching the bag. He calls Markle out. Both teams had essentially left the the game. The fans were all over the field. There was basically going to be a riot. So they left it up to the league office, essentially what the league office says. All right, here's the thing. The game's going to end in a tie. It was a tie ball game. And if that game is of importance, we will play it again at the end of the season. Well, what do you know? They go in three wide. And it ends up being New York versus Chicago for the championship game. And it was Harry Pulliam, the NL president, 
that is the one that upheld the ruling. And so they replay the game. The Cubs win the game. The Cubs go on to win the World Series in 1908. And here's the kicker. That's the last time the, the Chicago Cubs win the World Series for 108 years. And many people believe that it had nothing to do with the, with the GOAT incident that we hear about in 1945. They believe it has nothing to do with They all believe that because they won a World Series championship they never should have been in, that that starts the Chicago Cubs curse. It lasts until 19, six, uh, 2016. So 108 years of futility. People believe it was Fred Merkel's boner that caused that. In 1909, you get the Pirates back in the World Series and Honus Wagner gets himself his World Series championship. And it was the Detroit Tigers once again. And it would be the last time that Ty Cobb would appear in the World Series with the Detroit Tigers. Ty Cobb also in that 1909 season had won the Triple Crown. Ty Cobb was the best player in baseball at the time. But many, many people believe that Honus Wagner was it was a better player than him not but not at that time at that time it was kind of an argument back and forth as far as who was the best player in baseball was it Cobb or was it Wagner and there was a rivalry there if you're not familiar with Honus Wagner he was one of the great players of all time he was one of the one of the very last tobacco cards made and he and that's why his card you know we talked about Christy Matthewson in the and the, uh, you know, the bubblegum card and all that Wagner was a part of that too. And that's why Wagner's card is always up for auction every few years. And it's always like someone godly amount of money. That's why, that's why his card is what it is, but he played for the Louisville Colonels and the Pittsburgh pirates for about 20 years from 1897 to 1917. But that was his only world series championship and sports. Wasn't what it was today. Today, no one gives anyone credit for being a great player unless you've got a world championship. Back then you, that, that narrative didn't exist. It was who was the best player? Who was the best man? Oh, by the way, he may or may not be playing for the best team. But Honus Wagner won the NL batting crown eight times. Honus Wagner won the won the RBI crown in the National League five times. He was a stolen base leader five times. He was looked upon in the very early part of Major League Baseball as one of, if not the best player in major league baseball. A lot of people go to Ty Cobb and rightfully so Ty Cobb won the AL RBI title four times, the stolen base leader six times. He was the, he was the batting champion 12 times. And one of the reasons why he was so made motivated to win that batting crown. And he has the highest batting average in major league baseball history. They had just started doing a thing where they were giving away free cars to the champion for the batting crown champion. And Ty Cobb wanted that damn car every year. And of course, Ty Cobb was one of the first inducted into the Hall of Fame the very first year it existed, 1936. And that's always the the hallowed year. Ty 
Ty Cobb, Babe Ruth, Christy Mathewson, Honus Wagner, and Walter Johnson. There's a lot of nicknames for that. The Fame Five, the Fabulous Five. But what you need to know about that is there probably would have been a sixth player had Shoeless Joe Jackson not been banned from baseball because he was as revered as any of those guys. So there you have the very beginning of the World Series. And I, I hope it gave you a better understanding of why it's so important and why people love it so. And this and this will build the foundation when we start talking about some of the other things. We're not going to go a year by year like we did there. We're going to grab some of your better teams, some of your better players, some of your, your better moments in the history of the World Series. And what makes this still, to this day, not only the best damn championship in the all of not just all of American sport, but all of sport. But it's still the greatest game we've ever known. Y'all have a great day. Good luck to your team as long as you're not playing my team. Hope y'all enjoyed this Once Upon a Pastime series. Please like and subscribe. <laughs>